Welcome, everybody, to the first episode of Season 1 of the Cabin of Horrors podcast. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you to all of our return listeners. I hope you guys are really enjoying the podcast episodes. Like I said, this is Season 1, Episode 1. So all of the episodes before this are what we are considering Season 0. Season 0 of the podcast was really where we got our footing, figured out how to even be a podcaster, what everybody liked. All the feedback that we got from you guys has been so amazing, and the support that we've received for The Cabin has just been so great. So because of that, we're able to shape up a brand new season of the Cabin of Horrors podcast. And there is tons of new stuff in store for you in this episode. You can definitely expect this format to continue throughout all 13 episodes of season one. And hey, if you still have feedback and you have things that you want to share about the podcast, please, I'd love to hear feedback from the audience. So if you have any thoughts or anything that you even specifically want to hear on the Cabin of Horrors podcast, reach out to me on social media, Cabin of Horrors podcast. You can also catch me live on Twitch, twitch.tv slash cabin of horrors and just drop a chat talk to me let me know what you think of the podcast because i take all the feedback from my fans and really shape the show into something that you will love to listen to and this week we've had some interesting news drop in the horror community we got a new movie trailer for the spirit halloween movie which is a movie that's set in those spirit halloween stores i'm personally excited for it i watched the trailer it looks like kind of goosebumps-esque it's got some kids in it. It's going to definitely be kind of a kids horror movie, but I think it's going to be cute. It's going to star Christopher Lloyd and Rachel Lee Cook. So really, I'm not mad about it. The movie's being labeled a family slash kids adventure movie, and the plot synopsis goes like this. When a new spirit Halloween store opens in a deserted strip mall, three middle school friends who think they've outgrown trick-or-treating make a dare to spend the night locked inside the store Halloween night. But they soon find out that the store is haunted by an angry evil spirit who has possessed the creepy animatronic characters. And the kids embark on a thrilling and spooky adventure in order to survive the night and avoid becoming possessed themselves. So it's almost like a uh, kid's version of Willy's Wonderland. <laughs> Where animatronic characters are possessed and they start trying to kill people. I dig it. I dig the premise. I can, I can vibe that. And it's a good movie I can take the kid to. So really, at the end of the day, I'm not mad that they're making a kid's horror horror movie because there needs to be more of that right these are the kind of movies that bring the younger generation into horror but not in a way that's going to traumatize them like i remember when i was a kid one of my favorite quote-unquote horror movies or spooky movies was hocus pocus i love hocus pocus that's one of my favorite disney movies period let alone spooky halloween movies and that movie really got me in to dark movies and horror and really kind of just like tickled my funny bone in a sense and got me curious about what other movies are spooky. Is there something that's scarier than this? That kind of thing. The movie is titled Spirit Halloween the Movie and it's directed by David Pogue and is going to be releasing on video on demand October 11th of this year. So you can definitely guess that this guy's going to be watching it because <laughs> I know the little one's going to want to and I'll probably review it for all you parents out there so you can take a look and see if it's something your kids might like. On the flip side of horror news, we got some news on some DVD box sets being released for a couple different horror franchises. The first one's Paranormal Activity. There's a Paranormal Activity Ultimate Chills Collection being released in October. It's a limited edition nine disc collector set, which features all the Paranormal Activity movies, including exclusive Blu-rays of Paranormal Activity's Next of Kin film and the feature-length documentary Unknown Dimension, The Story of Paranormal Activity. So that's going to drop on October 11th as well, 2022. And this marks the first time that the Paranormal Activity Next of Kin movie has actually been available on physical media. Same with the documentary Unknown Dimension. So they're releasing it in one box set. It's going to be a nine-disc collector set. And the official description says, for the first time in one complete set, all seven terrifying Paranormal Activity movies come together, including, exclusive to this box set, the latest thriller paranormal activity next of kin and the definitive documentary unknown dimension the story of paranormal activity you can pre-order it now from amazon cost looks to be about 67.99 us so horror fans if you want to grab this i would head over to amazon get your pre-order on it looks pretty sweet i'm looking at the box art right now for paranormal activity fans it's probably definitely something you want to pick up it definitely looks spooky and from what i can see in the spine when all the dvds line up in the box set it forms like a ghost hand 
which looks pretty cool. So this might be a great set for any uh, Paranormal Activity fans to want to grab. Now, the next box set that got announced really pissed me off. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a feeling that a few horror fans know which one I'm about to talk about because I was pretty vocal about it on social media over the last few days. So Scream Factory has announced that they are going to be releasing three more Halloween films that are also going to get a 4K UHD upgrade. So it's called the Halloween 4K Collection from 1995 to 2002. And this collection will include Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers, the theatrical and producer's cut. It will also include Halloween H2O and Halloween Resurrection. <laughs> and that's where it got me because I've seen the box set. I've seen the collector's edition. It's got some cool looking Michael Myers shots on the cover and some newspaper clippings from Halloween H2O. It looked cool for a Halloween box set. But as soon as you told me that Halloween Resurrection was included, <laughs> you lost me. <laughs> you lost me at that point. Because I'm not buying a box set for two movies where only really one of them is good. Like in all fairness, guys, Halloween The Curse of Michael Myers was campy. It wasn't the best entry. I'm not saying it was all that bad outside of the mask. The mask in that movie was probably the worst mask we've ever had. Halloween H2O is the best movie out like in that box set, hands down. Halloween H2O, great movie. Halloween Resurrection, the worst fucking movie. Killing Laurie Strode unceremoniously. Having Busta Rhymes drop kick fucking or roundhouse kick Michael Myers. Ugh. So no, no, I'm definitely not purchasing this box set, but I know a few of you are and a few of you will enjoy it, which is awesome, but I'm literally not going to buy it because it's a waste of money to include Halloween Resurrection. But if you want it, it's going to be coming out on October 4th, 2022. And if you pre-order the 4K Ultra HD set from shoutfactory.com, you get three exclusive 18 by 24 inch rolled posters featuring the new artwork for all three Halloween sequels. So that's a pretty cool addition for a pre-order. So head on over to Shout Factory if you want to pre-order. And to round out the news for this episode of the podcast, we're going to talk about the Treehouse of Horror episode of The Simpsons this year, which is the annual Halloween episode that The Simpsons airs. And of course, if you're a Simpsons fan, you know about Treehouse of Horror and you wait every year for what that episode is going to be because it's usually pretty violent. This year... Looks like it's going to be no different, except for the first time ever, they're going to be airing two different brand new episodes. So one of the two Treehouse of Horror episodes will take a familiar anthology approach, and the other will be a full-length 20-minute parody of It, which I am so excited for. They're going to do an entire Treehouse of Horror episode that's going to be a parody of of it. So that's going to be really exciting. I can't wait for that. So stay tuned for more news on that because as we hear more details about what we can expect from that episode, you can be sure that I'm going to be talking about it. One of the newest series that we're going to be doing here on every episode of the podcast is The Tropes of Horror. So every episode, we're going to be talking about a specific horror movie trope. And we're going to talk about how it started, how it got defined, what movies really made it a predominant trope in the horror genre. And that will bring us in to our movie review for the day. Our trope of horror for this week's episode is Final Girls. The Final Girl trope is very predominant in slasher films, but it does make its way into other genres of horror as well. The trope refers to the last woman alive to confront a killer in a horror movie. And the term was first coined by Carol J. Clover in her book, Men, Women, and Chainsaws, Gender in the Modern Horror Film, which was released in 1992. Clover suggests that in these films, the audience begins with sharing the perspective of the killer, and then you begin to relate and share in their philosophies or ideals. However, as the movie progresses, the audience begins to experience a shift in their identification towards the final girl. And the term final girl was described by Clover in 1992 as quite narrow. She studied slasher films from the 70s and 80s and defined the final girl as a female who is the sole survivor of a group of people who are being chased by a villain. The female gets a final confrontation with the villain and also has implied moral superiority because they didn't have sex or consume drugs like those who were killed in the movie. The final girl trope, it's gone through an evolution over the decades. Early final girls were often the damsel in distress and saved by a strong male such as a police officer or heroic stranger. Then the tide shifted towards more modern final girls who were likely to survive due to their own abilities. 
though there is a debate on whether or not a final girl has to actually kill their villain in order to be classified as a final girl. According to Clover's definition of a final girl, Lila Crane from Psycho, she would be an example of a survivor and not a final girl because of her lack of moral purity. Laurie Strode, she's another example, specifically in Halloween 1978. She's saved by somebody else, Dr. Samuel Loomis. Though in many slasher movies, the victory of the final girl is often ambiguous or only an apparent killing. Just being alive at the end of the movie doesn't make the final girl a victorious heroine. Many slasher films, they have an ambiguous ending, right? Where the villain may still be alive, which leaves the audience with uncertainty surrounding the future of the final girl. An example of this being 1974's Black Christmas. Many final girls from the Friday the 13th series can also be debated as well, with Chris Higgins from Part 3 ending the film in a catatonic state. Alice, who survived the events of Pamela Voorhees from the first film, ends up getting killed off at the beginning of the sequel. So this argument is one that pushed forward the evolution of final girls, as many argued such representation of final girls actually expressed a patriarchal society where capable, independent women must either be contained or destroyed. So this has changed, right, in modern slasher films, with the final girl no longer always being doomed. Most notably, Scream. The Scream franchise doesn't kill Sidney Prescott at any point in time. And while we're on the topic of final girls, I actually recently read a novel by Grady Hendrix called The Final Girl Support Group. Amazingly graphic cover of a metal chair covered in blood and a story that sounds like a final girl team up for the ages. But man, I was wrong. (laughs) <laughs> guys i don't know if you've seen this book i don't know if this is on your goodreads or it's on your want to read list anywhere but for the love of god if you want to read the final girl support group please take the words i'm about to say to heart <laughs> because this is coming from somebody who saw the final girl support group cover and literally for two weeks straight wanted to read that book he'd go into the bookstore and get his other books that were that were on my list and every time i went in the bookstore i saw the cover it haunted me and I'm like man that book looks so good and the premise sounds so great I really want to read this I love slasher movies I love horror this book is for me I I'm so pumped for this book oh my god I'm so excited and I was so fucking disappointed to the point where I had to force myself to actually finish the book we'll talk a little bit about it right now I'll let you know what the book's about so the story surrounds Lynette Tarkenton she's one of the several women who make up this final girl support group of women who survive horrific massacres One of them's a camp counselor who survived a killer. Another was attacked by cannibals. And they each have different killers that reminisce different horror movies in our real life. So Lynette is barely hanging on to her life. She spends most of her time sequestered in her apartment. She's terrified someone's going to come and kill her at any moment. And the other final girls aren't doing much better with their lives. Infamy and subsequent horror movie series is about their experiences. Really made it difficult for them to move forward in life. So the support group itself, it's one of the only things in Lynette's life that makes it safe for her to leave her apartment. Now, one of the final girls turns up dead. So Lynette starts believing that someone's out to kill all the final girls once and for all. Makes sense. Great premise. I'm here for it. So far, you've got me. This book just had so much potential. Like, it started off strong, and it made this slasher fan here chomp at the bit to want to read more. Though I progressed through the book, and I really began to feel empty. Like, I was hungry for something, and that was substance, which this book had none of. (laughs) There's constant catfights, and there's a lack of any actual gore or horror, which made this book seem like someone who wanted to capitalize on the horror genre as a fucking money grab. The novel's basically just a coming-of-age story, which surrounds women who suffer from PTSD and then one of them finally conquering their demons. Character development itself, extremely poor. To the point where literally halfway through the book, the author brings back characters you don't even remember or have a connection to. Like, it's a quick summer read if you enjoy sorority girls fighting amongst each other and being gaslighting petty bitches. But other than that, it's not really a horror book. It's not a book that's like, oh, the final girls are teaming up to go take on this killer once and for all and face their demons. Nah, they're bitching at each other the whole fucking time, even pointing the finger at one another and then fucking go off at the end and don't even team up. Like, it's no. No, terrible ending too, by the way. And when the book was in the writing phase, Grady Hendrix, the book's author, chose not to read other books centered around final girls as he didn't want outside influence affecting the story. Though it probably would have done him some good. (laughs) It probably would have done him some good to actually have had some 
fucking inspiration for this book. He completed the first draft of the novel in 2014, though he wasn't able to sell the manuscript because Riley Sager had just announced he would be writing his own novel, The Final Girls, Final Girls that came out. Though this seemed to be a happy accident for Hendrix because he actually rewrote the last half of the novel prior to its release, stating that he wasn't able to stick the landing. Well, I'm really sorry, Grady Hendrix, but you still weren't able to stick the landing. The ending fell completely flat for me, and it it actually really pissed me off to some degree. Though people do seem to have enjoyed the Final Girl support group, there is a group of people who seem to have enjoyed the book. There's an audiobook version as well, which is quite interesting because it's actually narrated by a Final Girl. Adrian King herself from the first Friday the 13th movie narrates the audiobook for the Final Girl support group. And the popularity of the book was enough to have the book now become adapted for a television series. Screenwriters are already working on the adaptation, saying that it does something different than all the rest and could reinvent slashers in a major way, which I highly doubt. <laughs> like, they'd be smart to use the novel as maybe a basic template and perhaps write some actual substance to the story. Who knows? Maybe they'll have a shot. While the novel itself wasn't scary in the least, the story of Corbin Cabin might be enough to make you want to pull the covers up at night. There's hiking trails in Virginia, and there are many things. They're scenic, inspiring, challenging, and educational. However, Corbin Cabin Trail is a remote route that takes you to an abandoned cabin in the woods. While the cabin itself is cute and picturesque, a handful of hikers have reported paranormal activity at the cabin. It's said that the cabin was constructed in the early 1900s by George T. Corbin in the Nicholson Hollow area of what is now known as Shenandoah National Park. Nee Corbin, who was George's wife, passed away inside the cabin after giving birth to their third child in 1924. It was in the dead of winter, and George had to bury his wife in the family cemetery near the cabin. And it's been reported that the ghost of George's wife still wanders inside the cabin, as well as the surrounding property. Her cries for her child can still be heard from the trail. All right, guys, so we're going to be heading into the movie review of this week's podcast episode. I figured I'd review a movie that really brought the final girl trope to the forefront and inspired so many more slasher movies to come. We're going to be talking about the 1974 horror film Black Christmas. girl's been murdered. Mr. Harrison's daughter is missing. And now at the house where she lives, the other girls are getting obscene phone calls. Yeah, what I've done is I've tapped this phone so that when it rings, it'll ring at the station house too. There was a little girl murdered over in the park tonight. Yes, I heard. Your phone's ringing. Terminal 55. Remember those idyllic scenes out of your childhood? Crisp winter nights, star bright, sleigh bells, crackling yule logs, candlelight glistening off of shimmering Christmas trees, chestnuts roasting over open fires, 
carolers beneath snow-covered window ledges. Remember those. Remember them well. After Black Christmas, they'll never be the same again. Black Christmas, starring Olivia Hussey, Keir Dulay, Margot Kidder, and starring John Saxon as Lieutenant Fuller. If this movie doesn't make your skin crawl, it's on too tight. When I saw this movie as a kid, it was absolutely terrifying to me for one reason. When the killer is on the screen, you see everything through their perspective. <laughs> That's a terrifying place to be as a viewer. Seeing everything from the killer's perspective and experiencing the emotions and actions they're portraying throughout the film, that's enough to scare any 10-year-old. <laughs> Black Christmas was initially developed by Roy Moore, who was inspired by the urban legend known as the babysitter and the man upstairs, which became a widespread phenomenon during the 1970s. Moore also took inspiration from a series of murders which occurred during the holidays in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. The filmmakers at the time felt that the college and high school students hadn't been really depicted accurately in American films, so they intended for Black Christmas to capture the astuteness of young adults and not make them fools in bikinis with beach blankets. <laughs> this I feel they did an excellent job in capturing. Throughout the film, there's not really many stereotypical tropes of teenagers or young adults. It feels real. And like people who you may have known at one point in your life, they did a really good job of kind of steering away from those stereotypical young adults at the time in the 70s. And they shot Black Christmas during the winter of 1973 in Toronto, and it also included the University of Toronto campus and some of its additional photography. The scenes which involved the point of view of the killer scaling the house was accomplished through utilizing a rig designed by the camera operator, who then attached it to his head while he climbed the side of the house. And Griffin's death scene was shot with a handheld camera in a real closet. And her character's surprise as when the killer like lunged out from the closet, it was actually genuine. The actress recalled her experience filming saying that she had no clue that he was going to jump out of the closet. So the reaction that she had was 100% genuine. And one thing that I found really cool was the shots that you see of Claire's corpse in the rocking chair actually had the actress wearing a plastic bag over her head for extended periods of time to get the right shot. That's dedication. That's dedication to the craft. And that's another reason why that shot is so iconic, right? When you see Claire's head in that plastic, it's terrifying. The film also utilized really unique methods in developing the score that we hear throughout the movie. The composer of the film, Carl Zittrer, stated that he created the mysterious spooky music by tying forks, combs, and knives together onto the strings of a piano, which warped the sound of the keys. Zitra distorted the sound further by recording it on an audio tape and made the sound even slower. Also, fun fact, the title of the movie was changed by Warner Brothers for the theatrical release in the United States. The movie was actually released as Silent Night, Evil Night in the United States and then was eventually changed back to Black Christmas. The reason being is because they were worried that people may think it's a black exploitation movie because of the title Black Christmas. So we're going to head into the plot of Black Christmas and talk about the movie, what happens. So if you want spoilers, either fast forward through the rest of this episode or go watch the movie and then come back and watch the rest of this episode. We open the film from the perspective of an unseen man climbing the exterior of a sorority house during a Christmas party. He makes his way into the attic when the phone rings inside the house. Jess answers it to discover another obscene phone call from someone who the house has dubbed The Moaner. Jess calls in the other sorority girls to listen as the caller begins ranting, moaning, and screaming in strange voices. They're initially startled by the caller, and one of the girls, Barb, decides to start hurling drunken insults towards the caller. Bickering begins to ensue, and the caller then goes into a sudden low tone and threatens to kill all the girls in the house. So Claire's freaking out. She suggests that the caller could be a rapist, and she returns to her bedroom to start packing her suitcase. She's so fixated on getting her shit packed that she doesn't even notice someone hiding behind a plastic dress bag in her room. It's not until she hears her cat meowing from the closet that she slowly approaches it and is then suffocated with a plastic dress bag. The Christmas party continues downstairs while the killer is dragging Claire's body up into the attic and places it on a rocking chair by the attic window. Morning hits and Claire's father shows up at the sorority house to pick up his daughter, though she's nowhere to be found. It's assumed that Claire went to a fraternity house for a party though Mr. Harrison gets help looking for his daughter because he's a little skeptical. We then shift focus to Jess, who's going to a conservatory where her boyfriend Peter is at, and she informs him that she's pregnant and planning to get an abortion. Peter becomes furious and tells her that they'll discuss the situation further that night. 
We then see Mr. Harrison, Barb, and Phil in town reporting Claire as missing, though they're not taken seriously by the sergeant who's filing the report. It's at this time, while in the police station, we also learn that a high school girl is also gone missing. Barb, of course, is drunk again. So she's the drunk character of the group. Mr. Harrison, Chris, Jess, and Phil decide to continue the search for Claire. However, it's not going to turn up well for them. Mrs. McHenry, who's the house mother of the sorority, ends up discovering Claire's body. But not before the killer sees her first. <laughs> Crane Hook gets thrown in her face, which hangs her and ends up killing her. And elsewhere, police end up also discovering the body of the missing high school girl, which is completely disfigured. Back at the house, Jess receives another obscene phone call, and it's at this point she decides to file a report with the police. Though Peter shows up to surprise her. He tries to get her to marry him and have their family together, though she refuses and stands firm in her decision to have an abortion. This infuriates Peter, and he leaves the house while a lieutenant arrives to bug the phone and determine where the calls are coming from. Jess stays at the house in case another call comes in that needs to be traced. While waiting, she hears Barb having an asthma attack and goes to check on her. Barb starts claiming she had a nightmare where she witnessed a man walk into her room, which requires Jess to try and calm her down. However, Jess becomes distracted when she hears Christmas carolers outside. So she goes to the front door and leaves Barb alone in the room. This gives the killer ample opportunity to walk right in and stab Jess to death with a glass unicorn figure. <laughs> Gotta love the kills in this movie. They were absolutely creative for the time. And in a terrifying scene, as Barb is crying for help, she's drowned out by the sound of Christmas carolers. And then the phone rings once again, and Jess picks it up. This time, the caller is replaying her argument with Peter. She hangs up the phone and the lieutenant calls her, lets her know that they attempted to trace the call, but it had failed. Though, they're beginning to believe that Peter may be responsible for the killings at the sorority house. After her and Phil get spooked by search party members, they head out around the house and begin locking up every possible door and window. Phil notices that Barb's door is closed and goes to check on her, only for the door to close behind them and experience an off-screen kill. Then Jess gets the final phone call, in which the killer alludes to some sort of transgression between two children named Agnes and Billy. The caller goes off long enough that they're able to trace the location of the call. The sergeant then contacts Jess and tells her, leave the house immediately, as the calls are coming from inside the house. Although Jess seems to have to be the hero of this story, <laughs> despite warnings from the police, she ventures upstairs to find Barb and Phil, the only discovered their bodies. Through a crack in the door, Jess sees the killer's eye as he slowly makes his way towards her. She slams the door in his face and proceeds downstairs where she discovers the front door won't open. She runs away terrified, only for the killer to pull her by the hair onto the floor. Jess then flees into the basement and locks the door shut as the killer's behind her banging on it. She hears the footsteps of the killer walking away, so she proceeds down into the basement. While exploring, she sees Peter peeking through a window while calling her name. He breaks a window, comes into the basement while continuing to call for Jess. Eventually, he finds her, tries to approach her while she backs away and grabs hold of a fire poker. The police finally show up to the sorority house and they hear screams from Jess. They find her barely conscious in the basement with the bloody body of Peter next to her. The police believe that Peter was the killer the entire time and they put Jess to bed in her room, alone in the house with a cop stationed outside. Though to end the movie, you can hear the killer's voice coming from the attic, which means he's still alive. You see the still undiscovered bodies of Claire and Mrs. McHenry through the attic window as the telephone begins to ring again and the film fades to black. Black Christmas is just one of those movies that's a masterclass in horror. Like, it inspired so many movies that came after it, like Halloween, Friday the 13th. It really became a template of sorts for slasher movies and the final girl itself. I loved Black Christmas. It terrified me as a kid. One of the greatest things I loved about Black Christmas is the ambiguous ending. It leaves the audience with a feeling of worry and concern for the final girl. Will she survive? Will the police find out the killer's still in the attic? We'll, we'll never know. And that provides a great ending for horror fans. And not only that, but getting to experience everything through the killer's perspective. Like whenever he killed someone, you experienced it through his perspective. When he had his mental fits in the attic and he would just start going psycho, you were experiencing that. It was a terrifying feeling. And it wasn't really something that 
any horror movie had done during during its time. You never were in the perspective of the killer. <laughs> like, you never saw it from that point of view before, which makes Black Christmas not only iconic, but so unique in terms of filmmaking. And that's why it's one of the movies that paved the way for many horror movies that followed, which we still know and love today. Now, the realm of horror doesn't stop at movies and novels. In fact, it doesn't really stop at all. And this includes when horror blends into the video game realm. There's a game I've played recently, which I need to talk about, as one of the funnest horror games that I have ever played. Recently, live on Twitch, I beat a game called Oxide Room 104, and it was a ton of fun. (laughs) It's full of dismembered bodies, venomous plants, and a terrifying mangle creature. It's a body horror game, which was developed by Wild Sphere and published by Perp Games. The story follows Matthew as he attempts to escape a decrepit motel after being assaulted on arrival. The game features multiple endings along with a variety of challenging puzzles to get through. And it took this guy right here multiple times (laughs) to actually beat the game and escape the motel. I'm pretty sure I did a good probably seven or eight different Twitch streams playing this game to actually finally beat it in one playthrough. (laughs) The setting of the game is Night Soul Motel, which is a decaying building that holds sinister mysteries. There's a doctor who's running experiments who lures Matt and captures him as one of his victims. The opening scene shows Matt waking up in a bathtub full of blood, which is a scene you're going to see many times after you die. (laughs) One of my favorite aspects of the game is actually how much the environment, puzzles, and gameplay change based on your deaths. You have a total of five tries. I'm pretty sure it's four or five different tries to leave the motel before you have to start all over again. And each time you die, the environment changes. So the puzzles will change, where different items are will change, and you may have to encounter more enemies, or perhaps that lockpick you thought was there isn't there anymore, or a certain way to get a key into one of the rooms is completely different. The game continues to change, so you have multiple ways to try and complete the game. The types of enemies you encounter in this game is also impacted by the amount of times you die. You can avoid some enemies by crouching or sneaking by, though some would need to be shot once you retrieve the gun after you've escaped from the first room. Though keep this in mind, ammo is super limited, and some of the most common creatures can take about 6 bullets to kill. So for the majority of my playthrough, I tried to avoid using the gun, and I just sneaked around the enemies as much as possible. And another fun thing about the game is the cinematic scenes once you die. It's like Saw. Like, I I feel like this game was inspired by the Saw franchise because you wake up in a room every time you die and have a horrific interaction with the doctor who dismembers each of your limbs every single time you're, you die. It's terrifying and it is so gory. It is a great body horror game, a thousand percent. And another thing that the game does right is setting the mood. Everything from the music to the lighting and the atmosphere in Oxide Room 104 really conveys that sense of urgency to escape and get out of the motel. However, and this is really my only complaint of the game, the guy who voices Matt, the main character, he doesn't seem distressed by the events happening at all. (laughs) Like, he's completely monotone the whole time, despite the fact his life is in grave danger. Like, the reactions are quite underwhelming. Though I don't feel like it's enough to take you out of the game's creepy atmosphere, it's just something that's funny in a sense, right? Because like, for an example, there's this one door where there's a woman screaming behind it. And when you go up and approach the door and he tries to open it, he just goes, it's locked. (laughs) Like, don't you have more to say or more of an actual inflection in your voice that there was a girl screaming behind this door, bloody fucking murder? Oh, it's locked. (laughs) That's really my only complaint on the game. But despite this, the game still holds its own and it cements itself as a terrifying horror game with a creepy antagonist and nightmarish creatures to kill and avoid. The fact you get to choose which rooms to explore, it also helps create different experiences each time you play it, no matter how many runs you do. I'll be actually streaming this game again live on Twitch in the future for an achievement run, so make sure you head on over to twitch.tv slash cabinofhorrors and give us a follow so that you don't miss when we're going to be doing Oxide Room 104. And that's going to wrap us up for the first episode of Season 1 on the Cabin of Horrors podcast. Thank you again, everyone who tuned in and listened to this week's episode. I super appreciate it. We've changed, obviously, the day that the podcast episodes are released now. So we're going to be releasing episodes every Friday instead of every Tuesday. So make sure that you're tuning in on Fridays. Give us a follow, subscribe, wherever you're listening to this podcast. 
We'll be back again next week with even more horror talk and more scares. And if you want to check us out on social media, come follow us on Instagram and Twitter, Cabin of Horrors Podcast. Come swing by our Twitch channel. We'll be going live on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays. So I can't wait to see all of you coming on in. And we'll talk to you next week. See you in the shadows.